Yama everyone. Welcome to the State Library of New South Wales online programs and to this very special edition of Talking Deadly hosted by Travis DeVries with Hayley Pigram. My name is Marika, uh, I'm a Gamilaroi woman and a project officer in the library's Indigenous engagement team. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the unceded land on which I am privileged to work and live, the Darabal people, as well as the traditional custodians of the lands from which viewers join us and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I also extend that respect to First Nations viewers who join us this evening. If you're joining us for the first time, Talking Deadly is a speaker series usually held at the library now held online for the first time as a special one-off series hosted by Gamilaroi artist, podcaster, writer and producer, Travis DeVries. Each fortnight, Travis has been in conversation with First Nations artists whose work has responded to the legacy and 250th anniversary of Captain Cook's arrival in Kamei. The series coincides with the library's Eight Days in Kamei exhibition, now open on site, and Bumali Aboriginal Art Gallery's Not Young or Free exhibition. And if you've joined us for um, previous sessions in the series, you will have heard from some amazing artists who have um, contributed work to that exhibition. Tonight, Travis is joined by Dara Woman and artist Hayley Pigram. And he'll be introducing Hayley a bit later on. Um, there's going to be a Q&A, so if for anyone with a question, please do put it in the chat and Travis and Hayley will be sure to get to it. Um, and so for now, a very warm welcome to Travis and Haley. Hello, thank you so much, Marika, um, and welcome, Haley. Um, welcome everyone who's joining us for the first time and for those returning. Um, for those returning, you may notice I have a different background and that's because I have moved apartment. Um, and I also have glasses now. So um, it's been, there's been quite a few life updates in the last two weeks. Um, but that's not why we're here. Um, to, uh, tonight we're joined by um, an amazing artist, Hayley Pigram, um, a Darug woman. Uh, you may have noticed Marika um, introduced uh, me as a Gamilaro man. Um, my uh, other side on my dad's side is Darug as well, so a country woman of mine. Um, uh, Haley has a work, actually two works, in Bumali Aboriginal Artist Co-op's current exhibition, Not Young or Free, curated by Kyra Kum Singh, which you can find at the Bumali website, uh, www.bumali.com. Bumali is spelled B-O-O-M-A-L-L-I. Um, Haley uh, describes herself as an urban Aboriginal artist whose art tells the story of a modern woman with an ancient heritage. Uh, I really see that in Haley's work. Um, she, I would describe her as a multidisciplinist, which is not a word that actually exists, but we'll, uh, we're bringing it in to the lexicon now. Um, there's a really incredible range of mediums and styles within her work. Uh, she utilizes dot techniques alongside bright colors uh, and multiple mediums some of which we're going to see tonight. We're not going to go through the full range of Haley's back catalogue, um, but we've picked out a special few to focus on. Um, we had a really great chat uh, this afternoon and I'm excited to jump into things with Haley. Uh, one of the things that I do want to mention, um, and it's something that sort of speaks to me as an artist as well, is that Haley, as an Aboriginal woman, is continuing, continuing to explore mediums and evolving how she expresses herself as a Darug person. Um, and it's something that I think I'd try to do similar, but um, Haley manages to do it incredibly naturally from what I can see of her work. Um, so the current works in the Bumali exhibition are Invisible Wounds and The Living Flag. Um, the Living Flag is not uh, on the online exhibition, but you can see it in the window of the physical side of the exhibition at Bumali. Um, but before we jump into chatting about the works, um, I'd love to throw to Haley and uh, get to, to talk a little bit about of her journey of finding art as a medium or as a creative expression, um, because it's kind of an interesting story 
Um, so Haley, like how did you start in art and why? Um, I grew up around artists, um, as I think a lot of Aboriginal people do, but I never thought it was my thing. Um, I always thought you had to have some sort of innate talent for it. Um, and then like, I always pursued like sciences and, um, you know, things like that. And then when I was about 25, um, I kind of hit a really rough patch in my life. Um, I decided that I needed to take a break from everything. Um, I had been studying, um, in a lot of different ways. I had been working in a lot of different um, situations and it just came to a point where I was really burnt out um, so I decided that I would drop everything because um, I was having a really bad mental health time um, but I also realized that if I sat around and did nothing it would be the worst decision I ever made um, so I found a program ran by uh, Mission Australia called Creative Youth Initiatives um, and it was an art program and I actually walked in there on the first day and I was like, I like art, but I'm really terrible. Um, and they were like, Oh no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Every, everyone, everyone thinks that. Um, and within the first month, um, I realized that this was something that made me unbelievably content and satisfied. It was a thing that I had been searching for for like most of my young adult life because I had changed, chopped and changed careers and studies and things like that so many times because I couldn't find something that settled a part of myself that was always restless. Um, and so quickly that part of me was just quiet um, when I was making something creative because I could express that. Um, visually. Um, so I found that through creative expression, um, not just like through, through making things. Um, and I didn't think that was possible because I had never, after year seven, eight art, I gave it up. I thought it was, you know, I didn't realize that talent was something you had to work at. You know, I was used to having innate brains where you just kind of new stuff and you know didn't realize that most artists actually have to work at it and work at it and work at it and try until someone pointed it out to me there was a phrase you used in our conversation this afternoon i was like it's just so on point and beautiful um and it's like that you found something that you could see yourself doing for the rest of your life oh, yeah. i say that all the time um, I say it like when, when people sometimes, when I get frustrated and I'm like, oh, you know, this is, this is so frustrating. I have to walk away. I have to, you know, I'm still happier on my worst day doing this than I was on my best day doing anything else. Um, because I finally found, I, I never thought I would ever find something that I could, like, you just have that click moment where you're like, I could do this happily for the rest of my life. If someone said, I will pay you minimum wage to do this for the rest of your life. I was like, yeah, I could do this, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's something that's not a job. Yeah. It's a it, core it's part of who you are. And um, I think the art, I had an art teacher there in that program who said, and I was like, oh, I used to joke about uh, when I became rich and famous and, and all that kind of stuff. And she's like, yeah, if you're doing art to become rich and famous, uh, you should definitely just go and get a regular job because you will become rich much faster. Um, but if you're doing art because it's your passion, then you'll be happy. Um, because, you know, it's going to take a long time or if you ever become rich and famous, but if you're doing it because it's the thing that makes you deeply happy, um, then you'll always like, it's the thing that'll make you happy. Um, and, and I was like, yeah, it's definitely the thing I can see myself doing forever. If no one ever buys my artwork, if no one ever acknowledges the fact that my work is good, it's fine because... I'm happy just making it, even if it sits in my wardrobe for the rest of my life. I'm, I'm glad that it's not just sitting in your wardrobe for the rest of your life because your work is incredible. And um, I'm very excited to be able to 
talk to you about it tonight and be able to share it with some people. Um, just a reminder for everyone, if you have a question, we'll get to them sort of towards the end. Um, and, but pop them in the Q and A box, uh, down on the right hand side of the zoom, uh, system. Um, but we're going to jump into a couple of your works now. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so that will probably be the main thing that people see. Um, but we're going to talk about your first work tonight, uh, which is uh, living flag. Um, so this, this is a piece that's in the Bumali windows at the moment. Yeah. And um, we had, we had a big conversation about this today. Um, but do you want to sort of, is there very obvious you're breaking up a little bit. It's the Aboriginal flag or a depiction of uh, that, that piece of design. Sorry, guys. Um, a little bit of internet connection issues on this end. Um, I think that's okay now. Mm -hmm. I can, um, what this means for you. Yeah, so I actually made this as my graduation piece for university. Um, I had spent the previous semester in uh, Canada on exchange. Um, and while I was over there, they, um, I had met quite a few First Nations people, um, which I was very, very privileged to do and very happy about. Um, but they had a lot of really similar problems to us, a lot, of, a lot of very similar culture, a lot of very similar, a lot of similarities. Um, they had similar things to our stolen generations, a lot of similar things, um, it was, the similarities were startling. Um, but one of the things they also had at the exact time that I was there, um, which was devastating, was that they had a court case going on um, about a young Indigenous man who was um, murdered by a white farmer, a rancher. Um, the Indigenous man was driving a car um, he was a boy, really. He was under 20 years old. And he was in a car with a bunch of other Indigenous uh, children. And they had become lost. Um, so they had driven onto a property to get directions. And the uh, farmer had shot him point blank range in the head. The rancher was standing trial for uh, manslaughter. And in the time that I was there, there was a lot of protests about that, like mishandling of evidence, a lot of like ongoing protests. Um, and in the time that I was there, he was found not guilty. Um, and it had so many parallels to things that had happened here in Australia um, that I was very emotionally caught up in the case um and very devastated along with the first nations people um in canada there was huge backlash now um, not just in the university community that i was with but across canada and even across um the us because the canadian and the us first nations communities are very close um but one thing i noticed was that they don't have a, a flag that binds them together and I know that sounds really trivial um, but when they're like protesting or when they're coming together as groups it's very powerful to have a flag to bring you together as a group um, and to take away the individual things that separate you um, and unite you so when we're having things like Black Lives Matter protests and we're uniting under this one flag. We might be uniting about slightly different things, but we are uniting together as a group and people might be um, protesting in different cities or even at different times, but we're uniting together and it allows for a sense of unity. Um, it's really interesting because you, you said you made this, um, we were talking earlier today and you said you made this during uh, uh, recently when um, 
there's been some kind of copyright issues around yeah. other people, other right Indigenous people time. using the flag. Like, right about the time. It was kind of uh, late 2019 um, when I made it. And it was right about that time when the copyright issue started to become an issue. Um, and it was right on that cusp when I was making it. And so when I first displayed it um, at, at Bumali in a commercial capacity, um, I had to check to make sure, like I displayed it in early 2000, um, I, actually it was late 2018 when I made it, in early 2019 when I displayed it in a commercial capacity, um, I had to check to make sure um, that I wasn't breaching any copyright because it was starting to become that kind of hairy issue. But because my flag is a unique artwork, um, like it's, uh, you can't reproduce it. Um, it's got all of these very unique um, patchwork um, pieces. Um, it's not a commercial um, reproducible uh, piece. Um, and it's got the printed pieces on the bottom. Would yeah, you would you like to, do you want to talk a bit about the printed pieces? Because that was, that was really interesting. Yeah, they're um, images that I sourced essentially from the internet. Um, and they're people's um, personal images of them using the flag. Um, so some of them are protest images, some of them are family photos. Um, some of, like, I just randomly pick, I randomly Google searched um, Aboriginal flag photos. Um, and then I picked out the ones that I liked. <laughs> um, and some of them are just people playing with the flag. Some of them are protesting. Some of them are very famous protest images. Uh, one of them is of the, um, the wall at Redfern that was torn down. Um, so there, there's all different things. Um, and then I did like an image transfer process. Um, I used a chemical that you actually use to strip floors. Um, yeah, it's very, very hazardous to your health. I wouldn't play around with it personally, but, but, um, if you're careful with it, you can actually strip the ink off paper and put it onto fabric. Um, and it gives you like a ghosty kind of image. Is this your um, first time in working with that method? No, I've done it before in other projects. It was my first time doing it onto coloured fabric and I wasn't sure if it would work, but it actually turned out quite good. Um, it, it gives a kind of, um, like, there's other ways to transfer images, like with more modern methods. Um, you can actually have them just straight out printed onto fabric. But if you use this method, it gives them more of a rustic look. And that was the whole appeal I was going for with this flag. I wanted it very rustic. I wanted it very lived in. I wanted it, you know, um, I wanted it to be like the Aboriginal people overall. We're very rustic. We're very lived in, you know. Um, I wanted this flag to be about our identity. You know, we're made up of all different people and all different identities and all different backgrounds and types and countries and... It's almost like the flag that's hanging in, uh, you know, your auntie's uh, garage or, or yeah. lounge room. And every, every auntie has some crocheted, um, you know, um, blanket that they've made with the Aboriginal colours and, you know, every, like the, that kind of idea of like that flag is very lived in, you know, and, and everyone has like, you know, our, our flag, like many nations flags are very ceremonial. Um, you know, they're not supposed to touch the floor when you take them off the flagpole. Um, you know, they're not, you're supposed to fold them in a certain way, you know, but our flag has never been a formalized flag. It's not recognized as a nation flag. Um, it's just, it's and it should, like, and it almost should touch the ground. It'd be grounded yeah. with us. I mean, people use it as blankets. We use it, we use it to wrap our children. We use it like we we use it for all sorts of things um it is a living flag you know it grows with us we use it for what we need it for and that's and that was the idea i was thinking about it like it it started off as a protest flag and you know and the top part the part to represent the skin i was like well we are all skin colors now we are all we are mixed with all different um people from all over the world 
I think you've really beautifully captured those sort of different tenants that you're talking about and those different ideas in this one piece. Um, do you want, should we jump over into some other work? Yeah, of course. Um, so we'll get to the other work that's in the exhibition, but first I wanted to jump into some of your pieces that I find um, really interesting and beautiful. Everyone and, um, loves this lady. Really? Yeah, she's very popular. Yeah, all right, okay. Um, tell, tell me about this work, because I like this, uh, I, I saw this, there's, a, there's three of them. Um, there is dozens of them. Oh, there's dozens of them? There is tons of them. I have done her in all different colours and all different types. She was my first ever screen print. Um, I, and because of her, I majored in print media. Um, because I loved screen printing that much. She, she converted me. Um, <clears throat> so I tried screen printing for the first time. Um, they told us to do a self-portrait. This is technically a self-portrait, um, although it's kind of grown from there because when I handed in this project and we had to get class feedback, someone was like, oh, I don't see you this way. And I'm like, well, you don't have to see me anyway. This is how, this is my self-portrait. It's about you. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at the same time, when I looked at it, I'm like, they're trying to say that like me seeing myself this way is a bad thing. And I'm like, it's not like me seeing myself in this way. Like I, I celebrate seeing myself this way. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with me being a big woman there's nothing wrong with me being just a little bit crazy eyed, just a little bit nuts, you know? There's nothing wrong with me being like, just, yeah, just a little bit like, there's my anxiety just a little bit. There's just a little bit, you know? I don't, like, I really like, I did a whole series. I've got like red ones, I've got blue ones. I'm like, because um, I was just learning how to screen print. I, I wanted to get the technique down. So I think everyone else did the bare minimum and I did dozens of them so they're everywhere and I was learning how to do the marbling technique so that these are the the kind of marbling and different types of techniques that I was learning and I I loved it so it's like a also it's kind of even though it was originally a uh, self-portrait it's also like a character piece it like became, a character design piece it, it became the kind of character that I've embraced and I've used her in other works um and I really like her um, she, she, she speaks to me, um, and she's no longer a self portrait all the time. She's a bit of everything. Yeah. And you've moved away from, in this one, yeah. you've moved away from the screen print and this yeah. is a acrylic painting, I think. Yeah. So this yeah, way. And then you've, who, these, you've got these little guys in the background as well here. Um, yeah, they're also I've, characters I use a little bit. Um, I don't so know it's like a motif that you kind of have uh, found and started mm -hmm. using more and more in various works as well. Yeah, sometimes they represent um, nature spirits and sometimes they represent children. It depends on the work. Um, and uh, in, in this case, it might be a bit of both. I think it depends on what day you're looking at it and who you are. Um, this particular work, I... It's very powerful um, and I think it was a, um, I was, I, I was, it's a very sad work and when I was making it, I, I think I was thinking a lot about nature and about how, um, how sometimes like I feel like it's a little bit hopeless um, but at the same time it's not necessarily that way, like you know, there's always a renewal going on. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm a river person. Um, my, my people are uh, from the, uh, the junction of the Hawkesbury and the, um, the Par Parramatta. Um, yeah, the Hawkesbury and the Parramatta River. I'm pretty sure that's it. I'm terrible with names. And right, I, I, yeah, I think that's, yeah. I think that's correct. Yeah, I'm a hundred percent sure that's correct. Um, and so I often uh, paint and draw a lot of rivers. Um, and I, I think about um, water in my work a lot. Um, and when I, 
when I think about uh, things like how a lot of um, a lot of our environmental policies and a lot of our work towards uh, environmental sustainability is not fabulous. Um, sometimes my work, work reflects that a little bit um, and it's not always uh, uplifting. When, when did you do this body of work? Uh, this particular one was done in uh, 2000 and I believe 17. Okay. So it's been a while. Um, before we jump into some other paintings, I wanted to chat a bit about um, you recently uh, had your first curatorial uh, experience, which sounded really cool. Um, I didn't actually get to see the exhibition, um, but do you want to do you want to talk about the sort of moving from being an artist to also being an amazing curator and and talk a bit about that? Yeah, I don't think I ever realised exactly what was involved in being a curator. Um, so I got to give them props. Um, this year I curated my first exhibition uh, at Bumali with the um, 2020 uh, Mardi Gras exhibition. Uh, we called it Diamonds in the Rough and it was absolutely fabulous. Um, we managed to get in there, I think we were uh, with the last group of exhibitions before things started shutting down. Um, because we didn't realise there was a problem. Um, so we were very lucky. Um, we had our opening and we had everything. And then about six weeks later, we all had to start going online. Um, so we had a beautiful opening um, with a lovely uh, drag queen, Nanamis Corey, um, who, who danced up a storm for us, um, even though she wasn't feeling the best. Um, and we had everyone out in full bright colour, um, further, you know, uh, cementing my belief that God loves the gays, um, that we had Mardi Gras before all of this happened. Um, and it was just organising everything and managing all of the artists was very interesting. Um, How did you find the, like curatorial process different from making because obviously it's a very different mindset that you have to be in yeah um i would say it's probably not my thing um i enjoy making the artwork a lot more than i enjoy organizing i found it to be i found it to be okay um like organizing um where to put everything on the walls was i think something they kind of train you for a little bit when you're studying like I think um they they train you to have a better eye for it and to be like okay this looks okay next to this and you've got to have it at a certain height and all that stuff but at a certain point it gets to be problematic because you've also got to manage like all the personalities of the artists who walk in at the last minute and they're like oh I don't like where that is and you're like yes but there's also 40 other artworks on the wall and you can't move one person's work to suit them and it becomes like also a job of managing all of the personalities and managing everything and um, it was good because like the support staff at Bumali are absolutely wonderful um, they just they, for a first time curating job, they made it so easy. Um, they literally gave me a checklist of all the things that I should be doing. Um, and I was like, okay, have I organized this? Yes, no, yes, no. Um, and they were really good at helping me. Like, they're like, you should be delegating that, <laughs> you know? So I'm like, okay, can you handle this? Um, so they made it very easy. Um, and I think it was, I was in the best position. That sounds like the dream version of curating. Perfect. Um, would you do it again? Um, I would do it again, but only if it was something I was actually really passionate about. Because um, I think I realised that curating probably isn't my dream job. I'd much prefer to be sitting there making things than, you know, organising and phone calling and emailing and, you know, deciding where everything is going, you know. It's, it takes a very specific kind of personality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it does. It really does. I've had some experiences myself and it, yeah, I think it can be a job that uh, you enjoy doing some parts of it, but then other parts, not so much. 
um, and even have to organize that funding. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's another not fun part of it. <laughs> um, shall we jump over to chatting about some of your other works? And um, yeah. these are, I think, a, l a little bit older. Yeah, this is about uh, I'd say about four years old, maybe. Um, it gets hard to tell after a while; it all blows together. I was um, I wanted to say like I'm really taken by this series of works, um, like just the sort of idea of kind of layering this sort of ancient style on top of these new developments that we can kind of see in the in the countryside here and then there's like the ancient sort of spirits coming through um yeah. with the rainbow serpent i really liked this one like i really kind of made this one with the idea and this is a photo of um i believe it's the hawkesbury river um and again i shamelessly stole it off the internet um, but I figured I was going to be doing enough to it that it wouldn't be a copyright issue. Um, and I wanted to explore the idea that a lot of the, um, the country and the, the land and rivers and, and things like that, that are now in use and that are now, um, being, you know, built upon and the land that is now, you know, um, occupied has all of these ancient roots and histories and um these spirits that are just kind of hanging around um and it's you know that again that idea of that invisible history um like you can't always you can't always see it but it is there um and you know it I think it's very easy to forget because you can't see it. Um, oh. and I just wanted to make it a little bit more visible. Yeah, absolutely. I love the like almost veins going through the countryside here and that it is a living, breathing yeah. place. Um, and, and similarly with this work, like you're seeing this, uh, you've called it neon river, but you're like seeing this like alive uh, kind of countryside being brought even more alive. Yeah, uh, I played a bit more with the digital on this one before I painted it. Um, it was a lot more fun. Um, and just that, yeah, kind of idea that, you know, it's not just like, and I think it's, it ties into that idea. Like, I think there's been a lot of um, media coverage recently of that, that cave that the mining company um, kind of blew up and people, I think some people, there's that air of, oh, it's not such a big deal. Um, it's just a cave. Um, but for, 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 for some people, for, for the people whose cave that was, and for some Aboriginal people, it is a, it's a living, breathing item. Yeah, Max. Um, it's a living, breathing item. It has a history and it has a soul um and so, yeah like, it's a part of our home and yeah. very much the same on the east coast here like that that one that was recently in the news was in wa and like it's mm. no different over here with stuff that the mining companies have done yeah you don't dump chemicals in the river that you drink from you don't you know you don't kill your mother like you, you just don't so yeah i kind of wanted to illustrate that a bit more graphically um and then you've got this this one sort of jumping into that again um and this sort of blend of the digital and the uh physical mediums mm. um but this is like i think taking that idea to another extreme mm. um can you talk to me a little bit about your process on on this work um this um, was a bit more about the haunting of physical spaces. Um, and again, um, this was fairly simple. I took a, a building um, and layered another image over the top of it. Um, it's a, um, an image of flowing water, the Hawkesbury River. Um, and I believe the image is of, um, of, I think it's the Parramatta girls' home, but I can't, lay promise to that 
Um, and then I um, just used, um, when I, I had it uh, printed out in really good high definition, and then I had, I really put some really fine dots in paint on it, um, just to emphasize some of the lines, um, just because I wanted to make the water look more flowing. Um, and, you know, I kind of wanted to emphasize how some of some places are haunted by, um, like the, the things that have happened to them. Should we, should we jump over into the, the last work? And this is the other one that's in the Boom Marley exhibition. Yes. Um, and I think like a lot of these other works actually sort of speak what you talked about and speak to this work as well, but, and you can sort of see that, um, um, sort of stepping stones to these, this series of works, which you've done on, um, mannequins and this is called hidden wounds. Um, so talk to me about like the, the sort of two layers to this work that we, we spoke about today. Well, when I was kind of thinking about like the whole theme of, you know, Bumali's exhibition, um, you know, um, I, I was thinking, well, what, what do I want to present to, what, what kind of ideas do I want to present? And I was, <sighs> we carry around our culture, you know, and it's not always, you know, um, the, the kind of culture that people want us to present is, you know, the, the good stuff, the, the clapsticks and the, the didgeridoo, the, the yidaji, they want us to present the, the happy stuff, you know, um, they want us to dance and they want us to present a viable economic culture, uh, something that can be uh, sold to tourists um, or uh, tell stories to children, um, something that's happy. Um, but they don't want us to necessarily talk about uh, the mental health aspects or the, um, or they don't want us to express the, um, the trauma or the massacres or the issues that have been ongoing um, because those things can be two sides of a coin. Not that our culture um, uh, is is present with those but just that um you can't have the good without the bad anymore you can't just be like oh you know our culture is all about the sunshine um we we have to accept that um we have um the strength given by our ancestors but we also have the trauma that was given to them as well um and unfortunately, when we present the trauma that was given to them, um, we're told that be we're being racially divisive or that we're being uh, troublemakers or that, you know, um, we're, we're causing problems. Um, and that causes us to often internalise that problem. Uh, I think that we carry that. Um, I think we carry all of our ancestors. Like, I think we carry all of our our stories and our culture and our ancestors, all those things. I think we carry it with us. Um, and they're all, it they're all a part of us and they make us yeah. who we are. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. And I think it comes up in different ways. Um, you know, I think that um, whether you see it or not, whether it's, you know, visible or not, I think we carry it right here. Um, and we, um, it, it's just, you know, it, it's incredibly visible. Um, and this to me, like, I can see men who look like this, you know, like I can see men who, who are like sitting on street corners, drinking from bottles who look like this um, because they have been affected in deep ways. Um, and it's not that they need judgment, you know, they just need a hand up, you know, um, and it's it, it it's a problem that they're judged because people think that that drinking or that that um, that drug abuse is also a part of our culture, um, and it's not necessarily that way. It's just that it's a way for them to deal with all of this. Um, if you looked like this, you'd probably seek a way to relieve your pain as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a coping mechanism. Mm. 
Um, this is this is a male torso. You've often painted you. You've got a lot of these series with of works on mannequins, and often they're female. This is the first male torso you've painted on. Um, I've done one other one uh, for a friend. It was one of my first successful male torsos. Um, I have a lot more success with female torsos. Um, I don't really vibe with male torsos. Um, so I definitely have much more success with the female form. Um, I think the, the last time I tried to do a male torso, I was very unsuccessful. Um, so I've stuck mostly with females. Um, so I think that, you know, um, as someone who's not attracted to men, they just don't speak to me. Um, you know, when I try and like, I mostly paint, if I paint women, uh, like if I paint, I paint women, if I do the torso, but I think for this particular, um, thing, it was, there was just something about the, um, the subject matter where it was, um, the, the male one was more, um, poignant, I think. You know, yeah. I think I think I absolutely yeah. agree. Um, after we, in a minute, we'll go to Q and A. Yeah. But I think, like with this, there's this sort of powerful message of the like. You can see the dreaming patterns mm -hmm. on this person's skin, on their black skin, and then like this layer over the top of a, like a, a it's blood. And yeah, it is. Blood. I had to work hard um, to get that particular blood color. It's not easy. <laughs> Is there, but also, is there a time that like that trauma becomes a part of our dreaming as well? I think it, I think it has to be at this point. It's been too long. It's been 200 years, you know, it, but it's not, it's not necessarily for, for me personally, I'm, I'm all about the healing. I don't think necessarily that trauma is all that it's about. I think there's a power to that. Like that we're still here and we're still standing and we are still like, we're still a powerful group of people. Um, and they were predicting our demise for many years. They were predicting our weakness for many years. And yet we continue to soldier on um and i think that in spite of everything in spite of everything and that is there's a power in that um so i think the fact that um we are still here as a people and we continue to uplift each other um is a very powerful thing for our dreaming um i don't think that the fact that the trauma has occurred is something and continues to occur. Um, I don't think it's something that we need to shy away from. Um, I just think it's something that we need to look at um, our ancestors and we need to look at the fact that they have always been strong people. You know, they continue to put one foot in front of the other when all the evidence to the contrary, you know, everything said that they should have just laid down and died. You know, I mean, I know I probably would have, but they just kept moving. And, you know, here we are because of them. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And thank you for sharing all of this. Um, do you want me to take this image off the screen or do you, are, you, are you happy to keep it on while we do Q and A? Either way, I'm, I'm easy. Um, all right, let's, let's jump into the Q and A. Um, uh, they're all from anonymous attendee, which is a first. Um, so anonymous attendee asks, uh, do you hope people will want to learn more about Darug culture and history through your artwork? Um, yeah, I do actually. Um, Darug, um, as you probably know, we're not a large uh, group of people, um, you know, which is why I'm very excited that you're one of us. Um, and so I, I'm always excited when people have questions about um, Darug culture and, and Darug history, um, and because my usual questions I get are, you know, what, like, where are Darug people from and, you know, like, 
I've never heard of Darug before and, you know, all that kind of thing. So um, I'm always very happy because we are one of the very small, like, groups of people in the New South Wales area. Um, we are growing. I have two very pregnant cousins at the moment. So um, we're always expanding. Yes. Um, so we're always expanding, but... Um, it's you know we're very small in terms of uh numbers and there's there's reasons for that um being one of the first groups to have contact with um colonizers is never good for your numbers um but um yeah i'm always excited to talk to people and i've always like it always ends up being an educational experience for both me and whoever i'm talking with about being a direct person um, I might jump into one that I think can probably be answered a little pretty fairly quickly. Um, uh, can Aboriginal art be learnt by the general public or is it sacred? Both. Um, I do art workshops all the time, uh, some for Aboriginal people and some for the general public. Um, there are certain things that I do not teach to the general public that I will teach to Aboriginal people. Um, and it just depends on what I'm teaching them. Um, there are some specific things that you just um, are not appropriate for non-Aboriginal people to do in terms of art that are Aboriginal specific. Um, but in terms of um, the way we do art, like doing art about your identity or doing art about like the themes that we use, that's always appropriate. Um, you know, anyone can do artwork about their identity or do artwork about their home or do artwork about, um, you know, the, their self-portrait or do, you know, those sorts of things. Um, some certain techniques or some certain um, methods um, are not always appropriate but I don't use some certain techniques or methods because they're not appropriate for me to use because I'm not from, you know, Western Australia or the Northern Territory or a specific clan or group. So it's very specific. Hmm. Yeah. And there's a journey of learning and different layers of knowledge and uh, various things within artwork that are also within the wider culture and culture. Or I can't use like certain men's symbols um, because that would be highly inappropriate um, and it just would never happen. So, you know, and I would be slightly offended if I saw a man who doesn't identify as a woman in any way using women's symbols. Absolutely. So, um, someone says, I love your Aboriginal flag artwork. How do you feel about art as a protest vehicle? And how do you feel about the copyright issues surrounding the flag? I love art as a protest vehicle. I find that art um, can be a great um, protest vehicle. It can also be really useful as a non-confrontational way of approaching people. Uh, for example, if you have artworks that um, get your message across um, less confrontationally, um, people can look at them without having people like other human beings right in their face. Um, and they find it, it's more like an earworm. So they can look at it and then take on the message and then they have to think about it. Whereas a lot of people who are confronted with protesters, um, they automatically put their shields up and they don't want to hear what you have to say. Um, so I think that art and music and other um, creative options like that can be very good vehicles for protests. Um, and the copyright issues around the flag are very complex. Um, I think the owner of the copyright, I think it was about time he got his copyright back. He was entitled to it. Um, as an artist, copyright is a really complex issue. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the community uh, feeling is around who he sold his copyright to um, and what he's done with his copyright. Unfortunately, as the owner of his copyright, he's allowed to do whatever he likes with his copyright. Whether I approve or not is my personal opinion. Um, I don't necessarily love what he's done, but he's legally allowed to do it. 
Um, and and that's where we're at with that, um, you know. And good answer, really. You no, know, it's, it's yeah. It yeah, is, it's it, a hard thing to it's a hard thing to talk about because it is such a complex issue. It is a very yeah. complex issue. Um, have personal the, feelings the, the around the flag the as an is, image. Yeah, as Aboriginal people, we don't actually own that flag. The owner of the copyright owns the flag. We're we're allowed to do certain things with it at the moment. The big thing is that he allow he has sold the copyright for t-shirts. That's the only issue. That's the only thing that's changed. Yeah. Um, you mentioned rivers being represented in your work. How has being on country influenced your art making? Um, well, I, until I went to Canada, I had never spent any major time away from Australia or away from my country. Um, and so I'd never really felt homesick. Um, and it was really, really weird. Um, and so when I came back, I, went into a bit of an artistic frenzy um, and but also I um, wanted to reconnect to my country in a really big way um, and I feel like for me it's really strange because a lot of people they consider going on country um, things like going out to the bush or going um, out places and my country is suburban it, it is a suburb um, if you go to where my country is, it is like the Parramatta River. It is a river, a riverfront um, economic district. Um, so I think a lot about the sky when I think about my country, um, because when I look up, I think that it's the same sky that has always been this way. And my ancestors would have looked at this same sky and you know my descendants will look at this same sky it will be the same sky country and i like to think about it that way um because as much as the urban landscape will change constantly the sky doesn't change that much the moon will always be shifting in the same way the stars will always be fairly much the same and so I think about um, my urban country um, by thinking about the sky and the ocean and the rivers because they're relatively unchanged. I like to use the statement that even when I'm standing on concrete, I'm still standing on country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we've got time for two more quick questions. Um, so I'll just pick them out. Um, what's your favorite work so far? Um, uh, I'd have to say the flag is fairly much my favorite work, but to be fair, it's probably because it's the biggest. Um, and the reason it's also my favorite and I can tell that it's my favorite is because it's one of the only ones that I have not for sale. So, so I still haven't been able to put a price on it and let someone buy it. And there have been people who've asked. Okay. So everything else I've been able to like let someone buy off me, but this one is still sitting there not for sale. So I can't let it go yet. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, it's an amazing piece. Yeah. Um, who is an artist that inspires you? Oh, um, there's so many. So like, I guess... Um, my biggest um, non-Aboriginal artist would be Vincent van Gogh um, because I love all of the colours that he uses and the fact that he was completely insane. Um, and um, probably my biggest um, living Aboriginal artist would be uh, Bronwyn Bancroft because um, she's an absolute sweetheart and her work is amazing. Um, so she is just, she's very prolific and her work is fabulous. And every time you talk to her, she just, she's always got time for you. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one more question from me before we sort of wrap things up. Um, do you have anything new that you're working on at the moment? Um, I'm working on a painting at the moment. I was actually doing that today when I should have been doing other things. Um, and it's all about um, connectivity um, and 
um, how um, we have impacts on other people. Um, I think that um, we don't realise the uh, impact and um, uh, strength that we get and give to other people um, and the amount of connections we have to other people um, as, you know, um, um, as, um, as we go. So I've been thinking about that a lot as we're in isolation. <laughs> Um, and so I'm doing an entire painting about our, uh, the way we interact with other people and how the way we go through life and it ripples out into the world. So Beautiful. I can't wait to, can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite know what it's going to look like until it's finished. I didn't know what my flag would look like until it was finished. So it's always a surprise to me. Of course, as it should be. Um, thank you, Haley, so much for coming on. Um, it's been a really a pleasure to, one, get to know your artwork. Um, me personally, I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know your stuff so much more deeply than I had before and getting to hear you speak about it has been really special. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and um, thank you to everyone that joined us, um, returning viewers and new people. Um, and thank you to the State Library of New South Wales um, and Bumali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative. Um, Haley, where can people find your work or how, how can they stay in touch and hear about what you're doing? Well, I do have a website. Um, it's haleypigram.com. And uh, I am also very lucky that I am fairly much the only person with my name so I have a very unique name so if you want to look me up on any of the socials I'm just there I'm, I'm me so that's on the gram as well yeah I'm on Instagram cool uh, I believe I'm the only me on Instagram um, and it's just I, I believe it's actually uh, one of my uh, goddess pictures is my my picture so I'm very easy to find cool. uh, so if you haven't already please go to uh, at Haley Pigram on Instagram uh, and follow along uh, again thank you so much for coming on the show um, Marika did you want to come back in and uh, say a quick goodbye or anything um, just before we go, go and check out the Bumali exhibition um, at www.bumali.com.au. Um, and if you're in Sydney, get along to the Eight Days in Kamei exhibition at the State Library of New South Wales. Um, hi, Marika. Not at all. <laughs> I don't really need to say anything other than thank you both so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Trav. And thank you, Hayley, um, for sharing as much as you did tonight. Um, it was really inspiring, actually. Um, and I, I think the questions as well were really insightful and, um, yeah, kind of show how engaging it was. So thank you. Um, yeah, it was just incredible. Um, and everyone, please be sure to join us um, in a fortnight's time. Um, Travis will be joined by um, the artist Jason Wing. Um, Jason's going to be talking about his artwork, um, Captain James Crook, which currently appears in the library's Eight Days in Kamei um, exhibition. And it's the very, very last one of our Talking Deadly series with Travis. So um, make sure you join us. Um, and that's all from us. Beautiful. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye.